eye very similar to a human eye. We're talking about something which should have, because our common ancestor is millions and millions of years back. I mean, you are related to an octopus, but you're going back millions and millions of years to when you had a common ancestor, which would have been a mollusk of some short sort, because, you know, an octopus is an invertebrate. The fact that we share a similarity with them is, mal you know, is earth-shattering, because they separated away from us millions and millions of years ago. We should have very few common structures. We've got very few common, uh, common structures, you know, physically. The fact that, that we're finding more and more relational subjects between us is, is fascinating, because it does seem as if there seems to be some sort of interaction. It can only be a field one because physically there has been no interaction on a bodily sense between the two. Mm -hmm. The only line of, of juncture you can find is millions and millions and millions of years ago. Significant chunk of time, you know. Did you see a program not all that long ago called Animals in the Room? Interesting. Eugene always used to talk about this law in biology of. of um, Oh, Biogeny um, recapitulates phylogeny, where the stages a baby goes mm -hmm. through in the womb replicate the, the yeah. evolutionary stages through different yeah. animal stages. And you can see it's got a tail at one point and so on. And, but there was a program where... And gills. It has yes, gills. There was a program where they showed the development in the womb of um, a dog, mm -hmm. an elephant and a dolphin. They all set different lengths of time to gestate. Yes. But in the very early stages, they do look exactly the same. Yes. And the human as well. They all look pretty much the same. And they, they're going through very, very similar phases, although at different speeds, and, and only sort of later on turning into what particular animal they are. And also there are, there are structures within different creatures which are related to other creatures. For example, we've got a bone in our ear which is to do with having been a fish at some stage. And there's something in an elephant which is to do with having been a frog. Yes. Or something like a frog. It has echoes of, stage, yeah. And they're still there. Well, the interesting thing is... Somewhere within the animal. Why I'm picking up on this at the moment is because towards the end of the tape on Dido, when he's talking about heredity, yeah. He actually says that the uniqueness of the human being is that it does actually put off any specialisation. It is born totally defenceless, yes. can't look after itself, needs to be suckled, can't even keep itself warm. Whereas most of these creatures that we've just mentioned mm. are born with these, with these um, facilities in place. So evolution or whatever, if you like, is moving towards an amorphous creature that comes out and still has a lot of developing to do on the earth, mm. to be picking up information socially. Yeah. that only it's, its parents and the, those around it that can give it. So we come in, that we come into life, and that we're children for, well, I mean, it's 30 years now, but it used to be about 10. But I mean, <laughs> that we actually keep ourselves unformed. means that we Unspecialised, yeah. yeah. We can actually spread over a large area of things. This Peter Pan idea of never growing up, or putting off growing up for as long as you can, means that you, when your specialisation comes, it, you know, you can specialise in a way that has transference from different subjects, from one subject to another. We don't even now, I mean, socially, sticking one job. I mean, I remember actually being at a school meeting where the, the vice principal said to the group of parents, you know, before we get all caught up about exam results, how many people here are doing the job that they left school to do? And there were about four or five, and they were doctors and lawyers. Just about everybody else had changed their job several times. And these were only guys in their late 30s, early 40s, you know, and they'd all had four or five jobs. So, this, you know, as you said, you must be careful about sort of saying, you know, your kid needs this and your kid's going to need that. You don't know what he's going to need. But nowadays it's quite normal to offer a university course, which would have been ridiculous in my day. It's quite normal to take maths and French, which when I was a student, you know, would have been impossible. You know, you didn't do things like that. You, you had to go with maths and sciences, yeah, or French and perhaps a, a humanities and things, but you didn't cross over. So, you know, it's, it's one of those areas where we do seem to be moving that way, and evolution seems to want less specialisation, but more broader-based. You know, it's, it's one of those 
fiendish things which is which I find fascinating. But let's move on, let's move down to them, because if we've got that mechanical description of what's going on, um, we can run down into the into the uh, non by three, this quote here is is Eugene moving off from the non mechanical. Um <coughs> Um, shall I read that out? Did you read this out? Mm. Now let's have a look at this, the non-mechanical thing. The whole field of the absolute is all there is. There's nothing other than this absolute sentient power. This absolute sentient power, by its operations within itself, produces the universe. And as it does so, and we've done this before, impulses appear all over it. And wherever there is an impulse, the energy spreads from that centre and makes a spreading perimeter. I'm going to have a little draw here, so I'm trying to present this the way I understand what he's saying. What he's saying is, if we consider the whole field of energy, the absolute sentient power, which he calls it, as the white paper, which was his reference point for always of this. So we have to imagine that this isn't a sheet of paper, it's a field of energy. It's like milk, if you like. It's a depth, it's deep, it's wide, it's high, infinite this way in all directions, and infinitely towards you and deep into the paper as well. And in that, within that field, <coughs> what the universe can do is create points, and it can create points everywhere. And the point creates a point and then pushes outwards. It's an impulse of energy. And because of that, it can do that. And it can do that all over itself. It creates a perimeter. The perimeter is it's pushing outwards. And it creates a field of, uh, uh, sorry, a perimeter because it's pushing into a field of energy where there are other pushes pushing back. So imagine all those other ones are pushing back. Now he represents this usually by dividing this into six, which I'm going to do non-geometrically, and say that because this is pushing out, at all these points we can say, we can represent other impulses, other points within the field, beating back. So there's another one here, which is representing itself And, uh, and all these are beating onto the centre, onto that centre, and they're creating that centre, oops, and being created by it. There's one, two, is that six? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Another one here. So. There's the one still beating, there's the ones around it, and they're creating a sixth petal flower. Now you have to imagine this as a whole field, all vibrating like this, like a sonic structure. It's like a sound structure of waveforms. Each one of those is beating, and its perimeter is created by the impact of the amount of push it's got, and the amount of resistance, which is other push coming in the other direction. Does that make sense? Now I'll just read this that section again in terms of that diagram. This absolute sentient power by its operations within itself produces the universe. And as it does so, we've done this before, impulses appear all over it. And wherever there is an impulse, the energy spreads from that centre. So it's going like that. And it's making a, an impulse like that. A, po a point of energy, a push. And from that centre it makes a spreading perimeter. And at any given point in space there's always another centre uh, sending out its energy. And the perimeter is propagating. And the perimeter propagating from one centre becomes ultimately into the centre of another. So this one here, its perimeter, is pushing right out until it hits the centre of others. 